we can receive counseling in the form of love. But I can agree. <laughs> <laughs> I can agree. <laughs> Wait a minute, though. You see, I'm listening. There's, there's a there's a type of counseling that love can't give you. Welcome everybody. We are here today to talk about something that's really important and not discussed enough, mental health in the black community. So I'm really curious with everyone on the panel, how are you guys brought up? What sort of situations, what sort of communities were you brought up? Because obviously we talk a lot about the black community, but there's a lot of different, diverse, different types of black communities. So I'm curious what everyone's background is. I'm from a little small town, Forest, Virginia. You know, I grew up personally a very overweight, chubby kid, glasses, asthma, had a .6 GPA at one point in time. I started off at a public school, transferred to a private school, but both uh, predominantly was, it was only, at my private school, it was only one other black person there. Hmm. Um, I, st I stood out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I am a child of Nigerian immigrants, so you know, I'm the yeah. first gen, you know, kid. Um, trying to be my parents, you know, wildest dreams or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up in Tennessee, specifically Nashville. My parents moved out to the um, suburb of Antioch right about when I started kindergarten, so that's where we were. Um, for a while, it was a rich white suburb. I went to a bunch of different schools. I grew up in the suburb of Houston, Missouri City, Texas, and uh, the, we grew up in a black neighborhood, predominantly black neighborhood. Um, but we didn't have much interaction with our neighbors. We went to private schools, and so we were like the only mm. speck of color, you know, maybe one other in, in the schools. And I went to a different school every year. Uh, you know, my dad did not uh, believe, or does not believe in God. My mom was very religious, um, and so we went to her church. My mom's white, and her church was white. I grew up, I was raised in, born in Atlanta, raised in Chicago. I'm like the youngest of five, well, my little brother. So I grew up with a big family, a lot of people all the time, a lot of family. My sister's my brother, my granddad. So I'm, I'm you know, that's me. I'm all about family. That's my thing. Mm. So yeah. Nice. So I'm curious, um, I know that this is maybe touchy, um, but I'm, I'm wondering if any of you guys have dealt with any um, sort of mental illness or or met struggling with trauma or things like that. And um, if you if anyone was open to discussing that and how you sort of dealt with that um, in your upbringing and how you're coping with it now. I have PTSD. I have anxiety and I have uh, depression. Um, how I dealt, the, it manifested itself in my upbringing in that um, love my parents, but them being, you know, immigrants, they had vested interests in wanting their children and their family to succeed. So um, you feel that pressure growing up in that. So, you know, you got, you got to have the straight A's, and if you have the straight A's, you know, you come home with the 95, they're like, where's the other five points? Like, you got the A right, but they're still like, where's the other, you know? Um, so there was pressure there. And then um, for me specifically, you know, my weight became an issue. You know, I'm a big mm. girl and I'm okay with that. But you know, my parents were like, eh, not really. So there was a, a lot of like a fat antagonism in that household, um, which was also funny too, because they were also heavier people. So it's, <laughs> it's, you know, that interplay was interesting. So for me, even though I'm out of that environment now, you know, the way that my, specifically my depression manifests is that uh, you still hear that negative talk, but now it's coming from inward. Like mm. these people are no longer there, but now these messages are something that you are bombarding yourself with. So, man, you know, you know, I'm in therapy and whatever, but you know, it took <laughs> me a couple years to get to that point. I agree to that. Um, personally, I, you know, I, I don't, hold the label or classify with any type of PTSD. Yeah, that's how, yeah. My, my father was in the military. He went to the, he was in the Air Force. He retired on disability. Um, now, I, I've seen him go through some things. I, and I meant to mention, I have two older brothers. They're 10 to 13 years older than me. I was the whoops, here we go again, baby. <laughs> Definitely unexpected. <laughs> and so my older brothers <clears throat> um, saw a different father than I did. Mm. because of that gap. But I've seen him go through some things, um, medically, um, mentally, 
and you know watching how he balanced it. I think it's also. I mean, I've 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 got plenty, but I've gone through a lot of therapy and like deconstructed a lot of things. But e and even now, I'm still deconstructing, and I think that's going to be like an endless, uh, an, an endless battle. journey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, I have like pretty bad anxiety. Um, but you know, I grew up in an abusive household. Um, you know, even like my, my dad did not let us associate with the family much. My family, you know, my mom's family also ostracized her for marrying a black man. Oh, wow. And so we didn't associate with family enough, but even that brings a sort of, like, when you see everybody else having these yeah. happy homes on the holidays and you don't have anybody coming to visit, you know? So it's like simple things like that we don't really understand how it informs us, you know, growing up. Even things that I thought were normal, like, you know, my mom had, you know, dep back when it was like manic depression or incorrect diagnoses uh, of my brother um, and how he had to go through several medications and seeing that sort of trauma. And then also just deconstructing generational trauma within, you know, being a person of color in this country. So, you know, there is that that trauma that comes down from everything that my my mom experienced, everything that my dad experienced. Both of them went to segregated high schools. Um, you know, that type of thing. My dad did not have voting rights when he first turned 18. Yeah. Um, that seeps into us. Mm -hmm. You know, so there is trauma there. So when it comes to sort of discussing mental illnesses and trauma and things like that, like you mentioned that your father um, had PTSD. How were those conversations had? Was he able to go to, go to therapy? Was that something that was encouraged? Like, how did that happen? He should have, <laughs> um, but you know, some pride there, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think uh, there's a lot of pride with a lot of people, the reason why they don't want to get counseling. Mm. Um, they, you know, sometimes you see it as a form of weakness. Mm. And that's a myth that a lot of people buy into. And so my dad definitely was one. Um, he didn't want any anybody else giving their opinion on what he was going through, mm -hmm. and he acted out in other ways of turning to alcohol. Um, he drank every single day. Mm. Um, he smoked cigarettes every single day. Um, he slowly started to separate himself from the family. I'm 33. I made it to the league. I never smoked a day in my life. I never drank a day in my life, and it was just to prove him wrong, right? And in doing that, him watching his little knucklehead care proven wrong, he quit drinking and smoking himself. And so because of that engagement and because how I took that challenge, instead I could have took that and Lord knows what. I could have been a very angry, bitter, you know, F everybody type of attitude, but I took that as a challenge. And because of what he went through, it made us closer. And so I think a lot of times with PTSD, and any other label we want to give somebody, how you respond to it is more of the brilliancy than the label. Mm. And so we can receive counseling in a form of love. It doesn't even always have to be I setting across from somebody that's a specialized individual. Mm. And I think we've skipped that a lot of times. But I can agree to <laughs> <laughs> I can agree. <laughs> Wait a minute, though. When you say I'm a there's, a, there's a type of counseling that love can't give you, okay? Mm -hmm. And and like a lot of time, I think that like especially with the military, our government should be providing them with mm -hmm. much, much, much. I mean, so much th there is no reentry program. Nope. There's it's Here. not it's not a thing, and mm -hmm. and. And to put somebody out there and expect them to get help later, and they shouldn't be responsible for paying for it. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, you disrespect our veterans, but y'all willing to give away their health care? Like, it's just not. There's this yeah. this whole thing about you know, I, my dad was in the military, you know, and he went to Vietnam. And just think about, you know, he had PTSD before he went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like he grew up in segregation in rural, rural, rural Louisiana. So like, peak Jim Crow. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And he was orphaned. Uh. Oh, wow. You know, and that's not uncommon for black people in the South. You know what I mean? So, so your father's generation, like, you know, there's a lot of love can heal, and I 100% I believe that, but within the black community, as we're talking about it, mm -hmm. a lot of the time, 
we dismiss counseling, we dismiss therapy and professional yes. help because they're like, my, my dad doesn't even believe in it. He's mm -hmm. like, ain't no diagnosis, ain't nothing wrong with your brother, ain't nothing da -da 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 -da. All he needs is this. You know, they think you need discipline, they think you need church, and mm -hmm. they think you need some love and community around you. And it's like, nah, you need a little bit something more, <laughs> you know? It's a great thing, therapy is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good to talk about your emotions, mm -hmm. it's good to cry, get it all out and start to move forward. But I, I don't know why, especially as a man, you know, we, we kind of closed off a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's, that's, that's what we have to address first is the openness to even see it, mm -hmm. you know, which is hard. Well, I want to kind of rewind back to two points that you made earlier. So, um, the drinking and the smoking. So I feel like at one point, I guess millennials or whatever we want to call ourselves at this point have to have honest conversations about our parents' generation self-medicating yeah. because mm -hmm. they're not into the therapy scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't yeah. want to talk about it. My father is also an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. um, it's the reasons I have like some complex relationships with alcohol myself. I'm like, I like it, but I'm just like, because that is in my family, I have yeah. to be careful with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think about that a lot because my mom, you know, she didn't do the um, self-medicating thing, but she clung to like other things that I noticed. Like she was like a big hoarder. So mm. they were like, there were, there were, there were things that I feel like our parents did to fill that, um, I don't want to say emotional gap because I feel like that doesn't really quite get at it, but that whatever, whatever was eating at them that they couldn't properly diagnosed at the time. Mm. Um, and then the other thing I think I wanted to comment on was, um, I think the labeling is important um, because I feel like our community struggles, because it's, it's already tough enough being black. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're, you know, you're gay, there's, there's something else to add. Yeah. For a black person who does have, you know, a mental disorder, um, it could be hard being like, hey, I have this extra thing, because it's another yeah. thing. You know, it's another Adding thing on. you have to deal with, you know, on top of the other BS, so. You don't want to talk about my because I have... <laughs> I, I understood that my family wouldn't understand me for immediately, and so I ran away to Hollywood very young, you know, and so we didn't ever really deal with anything. You know, like oh, my yeah. family's very passive aggressive. So we, I, I, I like, we're the sort of family, we write letters to each other. You know, we never mm. have actual conversations. I, we write letters and then we read the letters and then we might not, not even talk about the letter, letter until it's time to weaponize it. So, Yeesh. yeah. Um, tips. Yeah, I mean, but like growing up, like when I wanted to go to therapy, you know, my little brother, um, both of me and my little brother were both adopted. My little brother was born um, addicted to um, crack. Um, and he has had an, an immense amount of issues because of that. Um, and they've always been really, really good at like getting him help, you know, like put him, my dad's a little bit of a hy hypochondriac, so constantly going to, you know, the doctor. Um, so they really made sure that he got his <laughs> care of, but when it came to me, they were like, nah. And I remember we were in family therapy one time because they wanted me to come in as part of his thing. And it was emotional. I, I sort of acknowledged that when I was younger, I had sort of dealt with um, suicidal ideations. And I had done all of this, like several different attempts under their nose. Wow. Um, but they didn't even notice. That's kind of how I largely felt. It's very, very ignored um, by my family and just sort of had to deal with things on my own. When we were talking about substance and, and, and using that as a, a way of responding to some of these things, um, I remember when I was, you know, in college and I was looking at, you know, different therapies that I could go to, it was expensive. I mean, like therapy sessions, yeah. hundreds of dollars. Yeah. And I was a college student. <laughs> I could barely afford Top Ramen, so, um, you know, but I could go down the street and get, you know, some Boone's Farm, you know, and just keep drinking, you know, that. Um, so I wonder sometimes if the lack of access to therapy um, is, a re is a reaction to, you know, look, we don't, we don't have money for this. It's not covered by our insurance, and maybe it's just not that big of a deal. Like, to, you know, maybe, you know, like, we, I mean, it is a big deal, but it's, th it's treated like, oh, you know, You'll get over it, pray on it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that'll be that'll that'll be the solution. Mm -hmm. My family very much had the attitude of, you know, if you have any issue, we'll just we'll do pray on it. God, 
God will, you know, show you the way. And um, I never, that was never really sufficient, especially when most of what I wanted my parents to do was acknowledge. So I'm wondering if you guys have, any of you guys have dealt with that. Um, I am ex, you know, ex evangelical, ex Baptist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, born and raised that way. Um, and definitely that was the uh, overwhelming attitude. Like, yeah, just pray on it, you know, God will remove it or, you know, you don't have it or whatever. Um, I, one of the things I actually remember doing when I was really young, you know, cause this is when I still bought into the whole thing. I think I was like seven or eight and I went to the little main pastor and I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna tell him I have an issue. Maybe he can help. Um, cause he was, you know, supposedly there to help, I guess, or whatever. So I told him, um, cause my home situation wasn't very good either. Also very abusive. Um, and I told him, you know, I explained the points, what was going on, and I told him, like, I'm really depressed. And I, ex like, explicitly used that word. And he was just like, no, you're not depressed. Like, why would you ever say that? Like, there was this whole, this whole, like, it was like a whole 10 minute conversation scolding me about using that word. word. Mm -hmm. And then another, like, explanation about how, like, God doesn't make depressed people. And I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> So, you know, that was pretty much the attitude. My mom and my dad haven't been together since I was maybe one or two. So I wouldn't say that my mom was like super ever like crazy religious, like go pray about it. But I've always, um, you know, made my relationship with God and kept that close to me. But my dad, on the other hand, he's Muslim. So I think when I was around 16 or 17, he might've found out I like girls and came and sat on my bed and was like, here read this passage aloud. And I just start, re he was like, read it. I start reading it in my head. He's like, no, read it aloud. And it's like, yo, like, you're an abomination. Like, wow. all this crazy. So I, from then on, I've always kind of been real weird. You know what I'm saying? Kind of weird, it's been a touchy, it's a touchy subject for me because that situation was just like, get me out of here ASAP. So I don't know, I've always kind of been weird about it, I guess now. I feel you. Yeah. Religion has been used to cult people and free people from the exact same word. Mm -hmm. um, the exact same word create, forced or was used to manipulate slavery. Mm -hmm. And that exact same word was used to release mm -hmm. slavery. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> when, you, when I look at the word of God, I look at his purity and I watch how we manipulate it mm. for our good, for what we want to happen at the end. I have so many problems with it. And I have, you know, and I have, <laughs> and I, and listen, I think it's given me my reason for activism. Like, I think that if you do follow the teachings of Jesus, you have to know that he was an activist. You have to know that he ran around trying to lift up the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. that he wasn't using it abusively, running around condemning gay people. But, you know, I always have, especially in, in terms of mental health, um, which a large contributor to poor mental health is the abuse of religion, mm -hmm. um, especially mm -hmm. in our, you know, communities. Uh, but, you know, I had this Latina girl that I think I really respect her, think she's dope. But the other, t the other day she was like, you don't need, I was like, I need a new therapist. I need a new mm. therapist bad. Mm. I'm like, we about to go into this election year. I need a therapist. Mm. Like, you know, it just walk, waking up, we're born into this country as a person of color. You're born into a hostile environment. Mm. Over the past two years with this fool in office, we are born into an even more hostile environment mm -hmm. every single day. You wake up and it's tension, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was like, I need a therapist, yeah. bad. And she was like, well, when you're connected to source, when you're connected to da-da-da-da-da, <laughs> you don't blah, 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 blah. You just have to pray on it. Realm. And, yeah, you just have to <laughs> pray on it and, and, and meditate on Vibrating it. Vibrating. And, and I said, you know, <laughs> I told her, you know what? It's so funny you said that because I've been praying and meditating. And you know what God told me? I need a therapist. <laughs> That's what God told me. There, there would not be therapy if God didn't want it to be there. If you believe in God and you have all these therapists around, you don't think you think that the therapists are, are sinning by giving people help? Mm -hmm. You don't think that they're ordained, that they, ha they have a purpose on this earth to help people beyond what the church can do? Yeah. I mean, for me, once my dad kind of did like, 
took us steps back in our relationship, I don't think I ever spent the night at his house again. Like, it was mm. crazy. I don't think I, I think I told my mom, like, yo, I gotta get out of here. Mm -hmm. My mom, like, cussed him out. But I mean, growing up, like, getting older, we never, which is so weird to this day, I'm 20 years old right now, we've never talked about that. Like, it's never been like, yo, dad, you know that was weird, or like, yo, Cody, I'm sorry about that. You know, it's right. never been, a more, it's more just so like, yo, two years later, this is my girlfriend. I hope you like her. So I feel like we've kind of weirdly, I don't know, brushed it under the rug, which sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that I, I hate, that I'm actually really realizing it right now with y'all. And I love them. I feel like dads are like my little girl. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it didn't all the way happen out all the way exactly. Like I'm still his little girl always. I don't, it's not like I'm a guy or I want to be a guy, but I'm not his super his little girly girl. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I'm just his little girl. You know what I mean? It's not what he looked like. It's not what he, yeah, that's mm. not what he expected, mm. I guess. But, mm. hey. It's funny, because you mentioning that made me realize that, like, me and my father hadn't talked about our stuff. Yeah, all, like, we know. don't talk about it. We just don't, never. Like I, like, I have a very, very distinct memory of my father looking at a news story about AIDS and being like, this is the retribution, you know, for the LGBT community. And like, I didn't say anything, I internalized it. It's kind of, you just internalize yeah. it. It's like, I can't, it's my dad. Mm -hmm. You know what, what I'm saying? Say? I don't want to go to my dad. That's supposed to be your, that's mm -hmm. my, my hero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My hero saying, you know, that I'm gonna, that's, that's what's gonna happen to that's me. That's my future, yeah. And that's like, you know, so that's why, like, I, I, re I think that was actually the moment I realized, like, oh, we're not gonna be able to, like, moving forward, him and I are not gonna. We gonna keep be it close. at him. Yeah, like, you're my father. I love you, but we're only gonna have so much of a relationship. And you know, it's weird because now I wish sometimes we we had more of those conversations because yeah, definitely we probably would be okay. Therapy is is a luxury. I think we've mm. agreed on that. Financially, is a luxury, mm -hmm. and I think freedom of time is a luxury as well. That's not really talked about as a luxury. Yeah. To have freedom of time. I got time in the day to do X, Y, and Z in the calendar. That's a luxury. Mm -hmm. So you said, you know, you were captivated being busy, mm -hmm. um, tied in, obviously you say you got, you know, some pride, mm -hmm. and then tying that in with, you know, growing up without the financial luxury. So all these things keep on naturally because of the survival, mm -hmm. pushing therapy away. Yeah. Yep. As I, I don't have the money, I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. Kind of just keep coming up with just, excuses. It, yeah. Like, you, can't, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And in terms of like counseling and therapy being a luxury, my biggest thing is it shouldn't be. Right. Yeah, you know, it should be accessible. It should be, it it should should be accessible. Healthcare in general should be accessible. It's like, like no. you know, it, but it's not. It's you not, know? not. It's like not, even it's not. like I think in California, it's like. 50, so over 50% 50 of the school budget is security in schools. It's like mm. cops in our schools. And you don't see them cops at Beverly Hills High School. Mm. You don't see, right? They're concentrated. They're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on policing and, you know, the school to prison pipeline, literally. Yeah. You know, uh, on making kids of color feel um, inferior, criminal, mm -hmm. criminalized, all kinds of stuff. And instead, they should be, you know, because we talk about education, health, you know, public safety is not, I, you know, this is very big to me. Um, uh, and it's largely comes from a framing from uh, Patrice Cullors. Public safety is not cops on every corner. Like mm -hmm. when you think of a safe neighborhood, you don't think of cops on every corner. Mm -hmm. So police don't necessarily make neighborhoods safe, yeah. right? They don't, Period. they don't make, they make them more unsafe, right? But mm -hmm. what makes things safe are jobs, health, healthcare, mm -hmm. right? Healthy people and education. Yeah. And instead of investing in education, they defund programs in, in communities of color. Mm -hmm. They uh, don't give us the proper books. They put police in, mm -hmm. you know, and make us feel inferior. They heighten the tension. They heighten, they, they heighten the discomfort level. Mm -hmm. And what they should be doing is investing more in counseling mm -hmm. so that kids can deal with, like, if they're not having, a, if they don't have a comfortable, they have rampant sexual abuse, abuse, or like conversations like you guys had, mm -hmm. like you should be able to go to a safe space at school and be like, this is what I'm dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you mentioning the thing about um, kids and making a party at school makes me think of all the kids who you know were written off as bad kids, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. You just don't um, have nobody to talk to. Yep. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, wasn't, like, you know, the proper help 
or you know the proper attention or you know maybe they had a literal like behavior disorder that they have no control yeah. over like mm -hmm. you know things of that nature. Recently I've been doing this thing where I'm peeling back a bit from social media because I've just recognized that it's not always the best for me. And I think that when I really started to feel this was when we were constantly, it felt like almost every other day hearing about an unarmed black, um, you know, teenager. It was usually, literally twice was, a week. Yeah. And it yeah. was exhausting and mm -hmm. upsetting. And I'm really curious how you guys felt about that because low key, like even though at the time where this was happening, I was living in, you know, not, you know, a re relatively, you know, safe area. Mm -hmm. I would go out like just nervous that if I did one little thing, I, you know, seeing the news, I knew that if someone did something to me, it would be justified by the basis of me just being black. Um, and so that made me, that really impacted my mental health during when I was really getting all that news. So I'm really curious how you guys have been responding to those conversations, especially around the time where, you know, Mike Brown was happening and a lot of the conversations and reactions to that. Being in, in the NFL, playing with the New York Giants, mm. when a lot of these things was going on, I got on a horn with myself and created a group chat. Mm -hmm. About 45 guys, right? It was 45 guys in the NFL, we all in a group chat. We're talking about things that we can do. Uh, personally, I said that I wanted to create <clears throat> a, a dialogue amongst myself, the team, um, the NYPD, um, the local legislation, and we brought in uh, Cory Booker and a couple other people just to sit on a panel and say, all right, realistically, because I got this thing that I call law versus emotion. Law versus emotion. What is the law, what is my emotion, and which one is gonna win? The law. So effectively to get changed, we have to change these laws, mm -hmm. as well as focusing on the process and due diligence of them. And so I brought in as many people as I could. Again, I don't have all the right answers, I'm just, this is what I did. And, and that was the same time period that Kat was in the group chat and he said what he was gonna do, took a knee. Right. And so we, we watched like I got a chance to watch everything on the spiral from mm -hmm. from like inside of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a it's a it's a difficult thing to deal with. Um, I personally try when it comes to social media, I put out things and fillers that make people ask a better question than the ones that's already out. When it comes to social media, I try to push out things that show balance. Mm. Um, and, and try not to stir up emotions unless I'm trying to use that emotional energy to create a reason to change the law. Mm. Because that's the only way you win. Create more emotion, 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 and, but it's not changing any laws or even mm -hmm. focused to change any laws. It's great to a degree. Um, I think everything's needed, but I just come from that principle. Mm. And so for social media, I just shy away from it, and you know, because I hear, so, I hear, I hate, I hear people have great intentions, but then they say things that are so unsound. So crazy. That gives another side a loophole to then mm, yeah. just pummel everything you just mm -hmm. stood for. Yeah. And I get frustrated in that. Mm -hmm. But you know, social media <clears throat> changes um, things a little because it makes them A, now readily available to you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like, you know, Kendrick pointed out, like they're, they come to you, like the notifications are coming to yeah. you. Mm -hmm. yeah, people are tagging you and Social up. media is like a world of things that you don't ask to see. Yeah. yeah. But you have to see it anyway. Yes. Yeah. Literally. That, that's the perfect mm -hmm. definition. It's like the news yeah. slash world star. Yeah. yeah. Things <laughs> that you don't really want to see. Yeah. But you're going to see this. Yeah. yeah. You know, back yeah, you know. when I was a kid, I couldn't see somebody get shot. I never seen nobody die. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like blood everywhere. You're dying. You're dead. But oh, now, like, my little brother can just watch a person get shot in the head. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's crazy when I think about that. Yeah. It's crazy now. And sometimes those those videos yeah. that are posted that are that graphic are posted by activists just trying to show that it's happening. But <laughs> right. At least for me, it's like I I. I, I'm appreciative that it is, that, that we're that we we know that it's happening and we have footage, but seeing it happen over and over and over again, and then seeing the response to it, and then seeing how people react to it. Well, he should have done this and he should have done that. Yeah, because I do music, I have to say this: when Biggie or Tupac died, it wasn't all over the internet. Yeah, it wasn't you didn't see pictures of them; they just dead. But when XXX died, rest in peace, mm. it was like everywhere. 
You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, wow, like people who seeing their favorite rapper dying. So it's crazy out here right yeah. now. Yeah. I feel like he, for us to answer that question, we have to be honest about the history of this country. Agreed. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the currency that <laughs> black bodies hold in this country, right? Mm -hmm. There's this preoccupation and this fascination with black bodies that mm -hmm. could be tied to, you know, historical institutions in this country. And I feel like when, you know, I feel like this plays out on social media because people put out these images. We're desensitized. Thank you. We're des yeah. desensitized, desensitized. That's and a good one. people mm -hmm. don't care, you know. Oh, it's um, a black person, of course. It's more just like, keep scrolling. You know, yeah. I'm saying, put, it's not like. You know, put this crazy. person, you know, in, you know, hanging from this tree in this noose on this, you know, timeline is going to be super casual. Like, I, I literally had to, I had to curse out a longtime follower because they, I saw that in my feed. And I was just like, look, maybe you don't care <laughs> about black people or black bodies. I don't want to see that in my feed. Mm -hmm. I just feel like it doesn't belong there. Yeah. And I feel like when you let yourself become desensitized to something like that, you stop giving a f excuse my language. Mm -hmm. you, just, you, just, you just stop. I have an interesting view on this because I, I agree with you in like, I think it's all necessary in different facets. I don't think that everybody handles it respectfully, but yeah. you have to think about, and talk, talking about the history of the country, you have to think about what em Emmett Till's open casket did, mm. right? If that, if there was no open casket of Emmett Till, there would not have been outrage, there would mm. not, it would not have made headlines, mm. it would not have sparked, you know, the, the change that it did, mm -hmm. you know, or, and I'm not saying that that change went far enough, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but you know, every bit of progress has been fought for. Mm -hmm. right? and no politician gave us anything. No, no, yeah. no benevolent white person was like, you know what? You're right. I'm wrong. <laughs> Give you everything. There you, go. you know, it There's was literally people fighting every single step yeah. of the way for any type of progress inch. that we've mm -hmm. ever had in this country, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the status quo would be kept for mm -hmm. those billionaires or whoever, mm -hmm. you know, uh, own most of the wealth. So I think that in this time, yes, it, it, it's highly traumatic and, and, and some people are desensitized to it and some people, I'm not. We talking about trauma, right? We gotta think about the type of trauma that's given these kids. You know what mm. I'm saying? A 12, 12 year old dark skinned boy, he just seen a dude that look exactly like him get shot in the face and he ain't asked to see that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like back, I feel like it was easier to control back then. Like you can turn on the news, okay, this is what I wanna watch. I wanna see the state of the country or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, I don't want to see that and I just keep seeing it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I feel like, I don't know, I guess it was more controlled then. Well, but I still that think it's good to see the, the proof. Like, I agree with what you said. You but, in, I mean? but this is why I say, I agree with him when I say everything is necessary because it, that yeah. is exactly right. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see the trauma, but also there are people on the street in Chicago, in New Orleans, in you know, inner city Houston, and all, that are seeing people killed that feel like their experience is invisible and they feel like they're, they're like, I, don't, mm -hmm. I didn't want to see so-and-so get killed on the I block. I didn't want to see my, first. but then they see stuff happening and they feel validated. They're like, that happened to so-and-so just the other day. And now people know my, you know, yeah. the pain that I'm experiencing. And I think it's more important, obviously for white America to see right. that, you know. Mm -hmm. right. It is the validation is huge. Like you don't, I, nobody wants to see it as reasons why though. You yeah. don't want to see it because this bothers me and is annoying or I don't want to see it because it makes me then have to respond to it. Mm. Like either way, nobody, even the people, activists, I'm sure you don't want to see it. Hell you know no. what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but when it's seen, mm -hmm. now it requires a response. Right. Yeah. And now, like, no matter what you feel, right. <laughs> we got to respond yeah. to this now. Right. Yeah. And so for everybody who's thinking, ah, like you said, that's fake. That's not real. Yeah. That ain't happening. He probably did something. Look at this. Yeah, and here's then that the person video. has to silence themselves and say. But I feel like after a hundredth video, after the hundredth video, it's like, fuck. Yeah. I didn't have enough proof. <laughs> this is enough. Well, yes. no matter who the I gotta talk to, stop retweeting this. Shit. It shouldn't be allowed on Twitter. I love it. it. Shouldn't be on the gram no more. I'm sorry. Yes, it's important for the people to see this. Yes, white America needs to see this. Shit. Mm -hmm. They yes. do. Mm -hmm. But so they've been seeing it? this. Shit. They've been no. seeing. They 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 see it, bro. This is they, new for them. 
Bro, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I'm not. I'm sorry. Say <laughs> like what you gotta say. But I feel like people, it. like some people, um, they were, you know, how you like, you got selective memory. You remember what you want. Right. White America, they see what they want. Yeah. They see this. They see this. That's they just like, look, they're, they're, I don't want to, you know what I'm saying? They putting their blinders on to yeah. certain. You know what I'm yeah. saying? They see it. That's, that's you know what I mean? There are also people who saw the Philando Castile video and, and still were like, well, you know, he's still well, probably he should have done that. You know, but I agree, though. This is great. This is playing out love versus emotion. Yeah. These emotions are going. Yeah. Now, what are we going to do with it? Right here. That's, that's, what, that's my space I live in. I, okay, we can get the people stirred up. They ready to roll. <laughs> now what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are we going to change the law? is the main thing to me. It's just my personal opinion now. How do we do this? How do we change the laws to make it more effective for these emotions to be appeased because it has validity for these emotions? Think about growing up like that and knowing that there's all this stuff happening and experiencing it, but having an inkling because of white people and what you see on TV and what and how you know the representation and the types of stories are, are out there, that maybe it is just me. Maybe I, I'm imagining this stuff and I'm just making it about race and da 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 mm. You know what I yeah. mean? Mm. But then when you have these these yeah. you know videos and, and all of that. It's it, identifying. It, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I mean, I agree completely. You know? I still yeah. just think it's, it should be be a little yeah. more control. I agree. Yeah. I, I know listen. Know what I'm saying? How does everyone on this table? How do you guys deal with you know anxiety, stress, trauma, different things? Like, are there things you can do to escape it? Let yourself you know go a little bit. Personally, for me, I sew. I made this top that I'm wearing right now. It oh, chills me out. Thank no, you. Thank you. It was an old granny sweater from the thrift store, and I took it, cut it apart, made something out of it. Ain't and that, no more. And no. Right. 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 Or it might be. It might be. I mean, or it might be. She a little. She a little. Y'all like crazy. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, that's, that's, that's how I deal with it, you know, it's just creating things, you know, mat like just manifesting something and like making it my own. So I'm curious how you guys, you know, deal with it, how you guys chill yourselves out. I feel like music is for me personally the biggest like therapy that I, that I have like, yeah, like I definitely have like social anxiety, I'll just be like, weird like when y'all came over i'm like on my phone because i'm just like <laughs> uh, you know what i'm saying because i'm just like a little weird but for me it's like kind of just keeping my blinders on to like all these things that really stress me out mm -hmm. try to keep them on and just music make mm -hmm. music listen to it all of that i i found a new therapist this week <laughs> um so that's one mm -hmm. uh thing um and I think more than anything, being a part of the solution mm. is, is, is highly uh, helpful uh, for me. Just making sure that, you know, I see these problems in the world. You can't fix all of them, but, you know, what you, I, I would suggest people pick the thing that they're most passionate about and be a part of the solution. Um, you know, my, my activism helps me a lot. It also stresses me out. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's stressful, but I think that there's two, I can go about it two ways. Like, I, I'm going to live a stressful life. I could either part of, be a part of the solution or feel helpless and do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like there's a catharsis and a healing in being a part of the solution. So for me, it's a twofold. Uh, definitely agree with the music thing because I literally have like playlists yeah, it's like, based mm. on emotion. Mm. So I'll be like, oh, that's my happy playlist. This is my depressed playlist. So I, you know. Put you I, in that I, dark I, mood. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who's on your happy playlist? Uh, Janelle Monae. Hey. Okay. All right. Um, my sad playlist, you know, that's, it took me back to my little, you know, my little teen angst days, you know, <laughs> my chemical romance, you know, <laughs> all American Rejects, Lincoln you know, Park, Lincoln Park, Park. you know. That's me um, today. So, oh, and then, Rejects. you know, I write but that's a that's a weird thing too because I also write for work but also you know mm -hmm. when you know when it's not work it's fan fiction you know I like to Ooh. escape and you know create different things in p other people's world sometimes mm -hmm. um the other thing I would add for me is that um, I also use social media to as problematic as social media can be to talk about yeah. um, mental health issues mm -hmm. publicly because I feel like People feel pressured to not. The stigma still there. Like even yeah. in 2019, you know, people are like, "You, if you put together, you can't have this thing." And I tell people all the time, you know, look. There are days when I wake up and I'm just like, "Why did I wake up like I get mad?" I'm like, "Oh no," you know. So I'm in. I'm honest about that. I'm like, I feel like you know, 
um, part of, especially for our age group, getting to a point where we can get to a place of like healing. Um, we gotta talk about it. Yeah. yeah. So I just make it a point to be like, hey, look, you know, I'm not good 100% of the time, and that's that's okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Now, for myself, I'm a I'm an autodidact. I love learning in an unorthodox way. So I learn stuff. That's that's therapeutic to me. I picked up the guitar, learned how to play that. One off season, I learned how to do a bunch of magic tricks. Next off season, I learned how to write fluently with the opposite hand. And next off season, I'm picking up archery, poetry. Like I always just learn stuff. That's therapeutic to me um, to figure out something I have no idea about. Learn how to dance. Uh, writing books, um, super creative. You're now, dancing with the star champ. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the most, one of the most therapeutic things yeah. I've ever done. That's I, crazy. I, mm. Growing up, like, if a dude told me, if I'm about to go dance, Period. we're like, man, get out of here. What's wrong with you going yeah. to dance? I've actually brought brought ballroom dance back to my hometown in the nice. wow. uh, yeah. African community. Like, you look like this. You don't think dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like as corny as soft. Like, I love it. Well, I wanted to thank you guys for having this conversation with me. I know that it was hard and we have various opinions and perspectives, but I think um, we, we really shed light on some really important conversations here. So thank you for giving me your time. Thank you for giving MTV your time. And Appreciate you for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Some rock stars. Yeah. Vibe. Yeah.